Imagine living the best life, a nice girlfriend and a powerful adventuring party. You think everything is fine until it all just comes crashing down. And the kicker? The man you thought was your father figure started it all. That's exactly what happened to the swashbuckler Nick. To rub salt into the wound, his girlfriend Claudine dumped him after he lost his spot in the party. Moreover, his mentor Argus kicked him out due to differences in thinking, in that he wasn't fit to be an adventurer. So now he's got nowhere to go. He's just sitting on a fountain getting soaked in the rain. He meets a woman who introduces herself as an idol. Oh? But he doesn't recognize her at all. This is because she's just new to the job. She's accompanying him because idols like her exist to make people happy. She gives him a ticket and her umbrella, telling him she'll be at Southgate Hall the next day. That girl is Agate, and Nick dedicates his life and money to the idol. But since money doesn't grow on trees, he heads to the Adventurer's Guild. By joining a party, he can properly fund his new lifestyle. However, his spirit has been broken by his former father figure. He finds himself unable to talk to people people after his self-esteem got crushed. How can you when you've been told that you don't think like an adventurer? He finds himself drinking alone in a tavern. Everyone else is enjoying themselves with their party except for him. One by one, lonely people begin to sit at his table. Well, it's not his, but it's the only one with enough vacant seats. One of them is a woman with a purple wide-brimmed hat. Judging from her clothing and weapons, Nick determines that she comes from a rich family. He can't help but wonder, is she a mage or is she actually an assassin? When the girl looks at Nick, he averts his eyes. His attention goes to the cleric, who smells like women's perfume. He just left a cabaret club. There's no medal on him, which indicates that he possibly got excommunicated. Next is the dragon kind. They're usually mighty warriors, but this one looks like a wounded animal. What a sad group of adventurers. As memories of his former party and girlfriend fill his mind, Nick surrenders to the idea that maybe he isn't cut out for adventuring. He toasts Argus and Claudine and the lonely people at his table in his mind before he drinks his beer. In unison, all of them yell, you just can't trust anyone. The four of them are startled by their joint declaration. Tiana was a member of the Arenafelt clan. She mastered multi-element magic and was frequently commended for her feats by her teachers in the academy. She believes that magic doesn't exist just to make lives easier, but also so she can understand others more. It's learning about society and the world. However, things took a turn for her when she discovered that Alex, her fiancé, has been spending time with Lynn from the Delcott family. Tiana mentioned that Lynn's from a family of upstart merchants, but Alex quickly came to her defense. He accused her of bullying Lynn. One after another, the two threw accusations at her, from seducing the teachers to downright paying for her grades. Alex claimed to even be humiliated by the fact that his fiancé is so much better than he is. Talk about toxic! Because of this, Tiana decided to go out on her own. Unfortunately, she couldn't get a job because they either didn't need a wizard or they didn't think a noblewoman would have been a good fit. She tried gambling, which evidently didn't turn out well for her. Yeah, she won some, but she lost more. She also couldn't join a party because her severe RBS scared people away. Now it's the cleric's turn to tell his story. Father Zem came from a city known for medicinal herbs and worshipping the god of divine inspiration, Medler. He was a cleric there, and life was good. He even paid for the pilchard grass gathered for him by a girl named Miriel. Eventually, Miriel confessed to him that she liked him. He turned her down because a man of the cloth like him isn't allowed to be with anyone. Miriel wasn't pleased to hear this, to say the least. To get back at the priest for ejecting her, she accused him of paying for her services. He was imprisoned for three months and then banished from his own home. Nobody believed him to be innocent. He was just someone who aspired to be chaste. But the next thing he knew, he was supposedly warming people's beds. The woman at the inn whose back pains he healed told him to try his luck in Labyrinth City as an adventurer. She gave him new gear and the rest was history. Nick doesn't know if he can believe these stories. Better to treat it as gossip told to him by strangers who will probably never meet again. Speaking of which, the dragon kind Kieran hasn't said a word. He turns to look at her and she claims that someone stole something very important to her. It doesn't take long before our dragon kind girl gets too drunk for her own good. He finds himself back in front of Claudine. He spots the amulet and realizes that it's all part of a con. Suddenly, poor Nick wakes up to find himself in the middle of a room. It's just a nightmare. Through his raging hangover, he discovers he's with the same adventurers from the previous night. Tiana tells all of them that they're in her room. As the three not-so-welcome guests leave Tiana's room, Nick remembers Agate's face. This prompts him to get everyone else's attention, even Tiana. Alone, they won't be able to make enough money to survive, but to Together, they might just have a chance. The group gathers at the Adventurer's Guild and scares the poor guild receptionist with their intensity. A more seasoned woman comes out and identifies Kiran as the survivor who got out of a C-rank labyrinth alone. The old receptionist tells them that the most important ability of an adventurer is to survive. She asks their party's name, and Nick answers with, Survivor. The whole party agrees on the name. They agree on three laws for the group. Law number one, don't interfere with the hobbies of other survivors. Number two, watch the money. And lastly, and most importantly, 
instantly, come back alive, no matter what. They agree to all have a part in watching over the money. Zem mentions that Nick might be assigning roles for his own benefit. Instead of being offended, Nick appreciates him saying this because if there's anything sketchy, it has to be pointed out. However, Tiana says that with how it's all built, Nick will have the hardest time if he tries to take the money. Zem notices that Nick's being very careful. He explains that it's something he learned from being at his old party, Masters of War. Putting someone entirely in charge of something isn't trust. Trust is knowing that the other person isn't out to hurt them. They should trust and doubt each other. Nick asks Kuren if she can find it in herself to believe him, and she says she wants to. However, it's harder to doubt someone. Tiana finds believing in someone the easiest thing to do in the world. Zem adds that this is because it's like you're putting someone else to be in charge of your fate. That's why Nick wants them to be skeptical at first. But it's obvious that this group of troubled heroes just wants to be part of something badly. Despite everything they've been through, they want to believe. The survivors will be starting at a G rank. This means they'll only be allowed to access three labyrinths. First will be the sticky aqueducts. They need to descend into the dungeon and defeat the boss if they want to achieve F rank. Nick shows Zem and Tiana the ropes for adventuring. He introduces them all to the slime, one of the easiest monsters. He even shows them the crystal-like object they loot from it so they can earn money. He further teaches them that if they do not kill the monsters and get rid of the miasma, every other living creature will be affected by it. The labyrinth might even get bigger. No one really knows why monsters attack people despite extensive research. What matters now is that they have to be stopped. Tiana's confidence in having defeated goblins and oryx leads her to have slime splatted on her face and be knocked down. This is why Nick tells all of them to watch out. To get back at the slimes, Tiana casts an ice spell only to accidentally have Kuren caught in the crossfire. Fortunately, she blocks it just in time. Woo! However, Tiana blames her for not staying out of the way. The dragon rebuts that she tried to trust Tiana. This causes a rift in the party that Zem and Nick can feel as they progress into the labyrinth. Oh dear, is this what it's like to be in a group of people with severe trust issues? Once they've reached the final levels, they see a huge slime, the boss monster of the labyrinth. Tiana acts recklessly and charges right in with her ice magic. They yell for her to stand back, but it's too late. The slime explodes, covering everything. After cleaning up, the party uses this time to evaluate themselves during that last adventure. They share each other's strengths, like Nick's skills in close combat, inventory, and bookkeeping. He also has zero knowledge of magic. So are they here to reveal each other's weaknesses? Nah. They all have their reasons for being here, but one thing's for sure, they've all been exploited by people they thought they could trust. People took advantage of what they were good at, making them disillusioned. He reminds the party that if they don't want to share, they don't have to. He will respect their decision. However, Nick wants them to know what they want to accomplish in the party. Zem takes the initiative to reveal his weakness in melee and and the arcane. His strength is that he is a healer at heart. Tiana stands up to bow in front of Kuren as a way of apologizing to her. She shares that she's a mage whose best elements are wind and water. Because of this, she can use lightning as a combination of the two. She can barely use earth magic. Fire magic is just not something she can do. I screwed up this morning. Tiana admits to Kuren in the middle of her turn. I'm sorry. She continues by stating she's helpless against earth, fire, and melee attacks. Kuren asks why she is revealing this to her, someone who specializes in close-range combat and fire. However, Tiana simply walks away and says she just spoke too much. Seeing Tiana feeling cold, Kiran spits out some fire to help warm her up. The dragon kind makes an offhand comment that it was meant to burn her. She just missed. The two women start reforging their bonds. Next is the goblin forest, which is populated mostly by, you guessed it, goblins. Zem realizes that it's much harder to fight humanoid-type monsters. Tiana uses detect magic to figure out about 10 more to the northeast. She used this spell because she knew Nick couldn't do anything of this sort. They're impressed by her, but speaking Speaking of impressive abilities, Nick never told them that he's really good at fighting. Nick says that despite their capabilities, they still need to be careful due to their inexperience as a team. They cannot afford to retreat either. The goblins will only worsen, and eventually, they'll start attacking nearby villages. Plus, it's worth the money. Ka-ching, ka-ching! Because ogres are resistant to magic, Tiana's task is to distract them, and Zem does the buffing. Kiran and Nick will be the ones attacking. They need Kiran's attack power since they'll need to break through the ogre's skin. The dragon kind assures them she can do it. With the planning done, they finally go to their opponent. As they walk, Kiran tells Tiana she still doesn't trust her. Tiana only replies that all of them feel the same thing, but for now, they're in the ogre's lair. So Tiana asks her, can Kiran trust the mage to have her back? Right at that moment, Nick gives the signal to run. Zem gives them a boost while Tiana throws icicles at the ogres and goblins. As she runs, Kiran thinks that she can. Tiana said sorry to her, and she's a noble. Nobility barely apologizes to anyone, so it has to count for something. She doesn't have to look back anymore. With that belief, 
Kiran summons flames to her sword and strikes the ogre down. Nick loots the monsters. He asks the others if they want to try, but Tiana refuses by citing Law 1. Nick explains that this isn't a hobby. They need to do this if they want to get paid. Kiran has a moment with herself, but this gets interrupted after Nick struggles to take out the ogre's horns. They're both surprised to see a cracked swan pendant. Dragon kinds are a proud race with a special duty, to serve the man who will become the hero and save the world. Kiran arrives at Labyrinth City clueless and wide-eyed. She almost got scammed into paying 10,000 Dina for a swan pendant she is accused of damaging. A blonde knight, Kalios, explained to her that scratching an item like this is a common trick scammers use with a little bait and switch. Kiran believed in Kalios. She shared everything with him. She believed in him. All he expected was that she did what she was good at. During a quest to defeat the pot snake, she saw it glow green, not realizing it was a paralyzing poison. Kalios killed the snake and took everything, including her most prized possession, the Dragon King's jewel. This jewel was made with the finest items and was supposed to grow with her. It was given to Kuran by her clan. She used every bit of her willpower to go back and get it. However, upon arriving, she discovered that Kalios had left without her. He told everyone that she died in the labyrinth. He stole all her things and left her for dead. Out of range, she snapped the pendant off her neck. She made it her life's quest to search for Kalios. Eventually, she came across Fifth, the Solo Eater. He was apparently so strong that the guild allowed him to go to Labyrinth alone. His registered party name was the Solo Eater. Kiran developed a fascination for him and began following him wherever he went, even copying everything he did. The last time she saw him, he recommended she eat the stir-fried shrimp and mushrooms. She was grateful to have met him. Kiran learned to enjoy good food because of Fifth. All she heard was that he was busy at the labyrinth. There was a hole in Kiran's heart, but thanks to him, she found out that good food could also fill it. Unfortunately, this means she needed to make money because good food needs money. And then she met her new party. Nick felt so guilty about cracking the pendant that he decides to look for one to replace it. He cannot help but wonder why Kiran didn't get mad. While searching for a replacement, he meets Agate, and they sit together at the fountain where they first met. He shares with her that he thinks Kiran is mad at her and is just not showing it. Agate suggests that they talk. He can even ask where she bought it. It's rather selfish to do these things and not consider what Kiran truly feels. However, she's certain she was just as selfish on the day they first talked in the rain. Oh, she has an idea. Why not just offer his own self? Later that day, Nick spots Kiran at the Haponyaki stall. He tries it, but it's so spicy that he ends up grasping his neck. Kiran jokes that he better chew, or else the living critters on top will eat his insides. Her laughter makes him smile. While on a bridge with Kiran, Nick asks her if she likes birds. Yeah, she does. You know, with sauce or salt. Or that nice crispy skin. Mm. Nick clarifies with her that he meant living birds like swans. Kiran says she doesn't know because she never had it. At this point, she reveals that she knows Nick is worrying about the pendant. She assures him that she really isn't angry. She's better off where she is right now. She offers more of her food to Nick, who again badly reacts to a bite. The two share a laugh together. Once they're back at the tavern, the other adventurers congratulate them for their promotion to F rank. They all go to their regular table, with Tiana ignoring her suitors. Kira never imagined that she'll ever find peace again. So to hell with this swan pendant. She flips it over and loses it in the pub. The receptionist at the Adventurer's Guild approaches the survivors and asks if they can search the labyrinth of the bonds. The old woman from before convinces them to get the Sword of Bonds. After a series of betrayals and misfortunes, the four adventurers are finally beginning to find solace in one another. Looks like this party is off to a good start. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.